Hello everyone, Mr. Chu here with an SAT review video. This is module one, all 27 problems. So it'll be a longer video. You can always pause it, work along on a piece of paper, and then come back to it if you need to. So this is module one. There are six modules. There are videos with two to three problems on each one that I made. If you need the shorter videos, they're available in a playlist at my YouTube channel. These problems have been released by the College Board for SAT review. They could also be used on the ACT and the ASVAB if you are getting ready for those tests. Some will be easy for you, some will be hard, and they are listed just in the order that they come on Module 1. So you'll need background information from algebra, geometry, number sense, probability, all the different classes that you've been taking up to this point to get ready for this important test. Make sure that you like this video. If, you're, uh, if you want to share the fact that, yes, it is something that has helped you, I would appreciate hearing that as well. Make sure you follow me on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, X. I got lots of math videos. Modules 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 are being uploaded regularly. Just as soon as I get them up, you will see them. Make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel so you can see more of these videos. And if you need to contact me, I have an email address. It'll come straight to me at askmrchu at gmail.com. Whether you've got a specific question or a specific request, just let me know. So let's get started. So problem one is easy for some people. but You just need to know there are different types of problems on this text. So problem one just simply says, what is 10% of 470? So on some parts of the, of the test, you'll be able to use a calculator. So hopefully uh, you will know how to change 10% to a decimal, which is 0 0.1. The of means multiply. So 10% times 470 or 0 0.1 times 470. So that means you move the decimal one place. So I start here and I move it one place over and the answer would be 47 or B. Now, most people say, oh, that's easy. I can do that. Well, I'm glad that you were able to do number one. Now let's go to number two. On well, number two, it says, which equation has the same solution as this given equation? So anytime you have something like this, just see if you can solve the equation. So what would be the first step in solving this? You would take and use what's called the subtraction property of equality, subtract 6 from both sides, and we end up getting 4x plus 0 equals 12, which would be 4x equals 12, which is answer C. So hopefully you're able to get this problem right as well. Remember, you can always pause these problems to work them and then start the video back up. So we'll go to number three now. So I also want to say that on every screen, I've got this red burgundy looking box. And it says SAT Test Prep Module 1 Playlist has links to the other 13 short videos. So I'm just reminding you of that. So there are short videos you can watch if you would rather look at two or three problems at a time. All right, on number three, and remember, you can always pause this video and try each problem. That is listed on almost every screen as well. Total cost in dollars to rent a surfboard consists of a $25 service fee and a $10 per hour rental fee. The person rents a surfboard for T hours and intends to spend a maximum, that's important, of $75 to rent the surfboard, which inequality represents this situation. This is another multiple choice question. If you notice, they all have less than or equal to because if it's a maximum, you're going to spend that amount or less. All right, so let's just talk our way through this now. You pay $25 regardless of the time you're surfing. 
So no matter how long you surf, you're going to pay your $25. And then we're going to add $10 for every hour that you keep that board. The variable T will represent the number of hours that you surf. T would be time. You intend to spend no more than $75, which is why it's less than or equal to 75. Then you write the inequality, and it ends up being 25, my money that you just paid to get the board, plus $10 for each hour of T less than or equal to 75, which is answer D. Hopefully you're able to get that one right as well. All right, now we'll go on to number four and five. So remember to pause the video to try each problem on a separate sheet of paper if you need to. All right, and remember there are shorter links that you can check out if you want in the playlist. The function g is defined by g of x equals x squared plus nine. That's called function notation. For which value of x is g of x equal to 25? So we just have to figure out, since it's a multiple choice problem, whether it's a, b, c, or d. That's what's given our function notation. And you could always substitute that g of x for y if that is simpler for you in this case. So if g of x equals 25, find the value of x. So I substitute at 25 where the g of x is. And now I'm going to solve this equation. So I subtract a 9 from both sides using the subtraction property of equality. 25 minus 9 is 16. The plus 9 minus 9 cancels out, and I have x squared equals 16. How do you solve an equation that has an x squared in it? Take the square root of both sides. That is the inverse of an x squared. And the square root of 16 is going to be 4. And that will be choice A. Hopefully you're able to get that one right. Now, if you have not yet done five, you could always pause it and then work on this. I'll move my face over to the side here on the other side. It says a face of a fair 14-sided die. Have you ever seen a 14-sided die? I've got some 12-sided, but I don't know if I have any 14 or not. That I used to use in my classroom when I was teaching math at the middle school level. It's labeled with numbers 1 through 14 with a different number appearing on each face. If the die is rolled one time, what's the probability of rolling a 2? So this is something that you should have dealt with in a probability class or maybe in a middle school classroom. So the probability of any event, simple event, is the number of possibilities over the total number in your sample space. So there's only one two on the faces of the die. And you put that in the numerator, and there's a total of 14 different sides, which would go in the denominator. So that will be one over 14, which is choice A. Hopefully you're able to get choice A. So how are you doing? How'd you do on the first five? Hopefully you were able to do well. We'll continue with six and seven now. So make sure you pause this and work them out if you need to. So number six, a printer produces posters at a constant rate of 42 posters per minute. At what rate in posters per hour does the printer produce the posters? So it wants an O rate and it wants you to convert. So the way I always taught this when I was teaching middle school, I taught them take your 42 posters per minute and find out how many posters per hour. So you've got to deal with the minutes and the hour. Well, how many minutes are in an hour? There are 60 minutes in one hour. So that really means that you're multiplying by one. That's called a conversion unit, the unit of conversion. A con uh, conversion measure from, from, you're going to go from minutes to hours. So here's the important thing. I write what I know. I know 42 posters per one minute. So I write that as a fraction. And since I want per hour, I've got to have hours in the denominator. And then I have to put the number of minutes that's going to just make that one. 
60 minutes in one hour is one over one. Well, why do I have to do that? Because the minutes are going to cancel here. That's the important part is to get this minute and this minute to cancel. So now I'm going to have 42 times 60 posters per one hour when I multiply across because if nothing else can cancel out. There's no more common factors. So I have 42 times 60, which is 2,520 posters per one hour which means the 42 posters per minute will equal 2,520 posters per hour. That was called an open-ended question, and some of the questions on the SAT will be open-ended, which means you will not have multiple choice problems that you can choose from, answers you can choose from. Number seven, another function notation. There's lots of functions in algebra. The function f is defined by the equation f of x equals 7x plus 2. What's the value of f of x when x equals 4? So this is another open-ended question. So you will not have multiple choice, so you have to work it. And for some people, substituting a y for that f of x just makes it seem easier for them. But when you're dealing with function notation now, we're trying to find what f of 4 is. In other words, I'm just going to substitute a 4 in where this x is and where this x is, and then solve it. So f of 4 equals 7 times 4 plus 2. 7 times 4 is 28 plus 2 will end up being 30. So f of 4 equals 30. So hopefully you're doing well on the two open-ended questions that we first had right here. Now let's go to 8 and 9. don't know what made my window shift here. I'll move her over just a little bit. Okay. So make sure you pause these if you need to. The teacher is creating an assignment worth 70 points in number eight. The assignment will consist of questions worth one point and three points. So there's two different types of problems. When I was writing my test, when I was teaching in brick and mortar, I would have the one points would be the true false. Three points would be the multiple choice. Which equation represents a situation where x represents the number of one point questions and y represents the number of three point questions? So we're going to write an equation. The first thing you have to do is assign variables. You always have to say what everything equals. Let's let x equal the one point questions, y equal the three point questions, and then the one times the number of x pointers you get right plus the three times the number of y pointers you get right will be x plus three y. And if you get a perfect, it's going to equal 70. So that would be my equation, which is correct choice D. Hopefully you got answer D when you worked this one out. If you need to pause it and work nine and do so at this time. So this is a geometry question now, and it also would have been covered in middle school or pre-algebra class. Could have talked about it in algebra, depending on how far your teacher got. Right triangles LMN and PQR are similar, where L and M correspond to P and Q respectively. Angle M has a measure of 53 degrees. What's a measure of angle Q? Well, when you're dealing with similar triangles, you can write this little curve mark, which is called a tilde, and you can say that triangle LMN is similar to triangle PQR. That's the way you would write that in uh, similarity notation. Well, when triangles are similar, I can say that first angle L and the first angle P correspond and will be congruent. And then the second one, M and Q, correspond and will be congruent, and N and R correspond and will be congruent. So that, if they're congruent, it means their measures are equal. So if the measure of angle M is equal to the measure of angle Q, because they're congruent, and we know that M is 53, 
then we know that Q is 53, which is choice B. Now this has been one third of this module and it took me 15 minutes to deal with the first nine problems and there's one problem that takes some time to work in the toward the end of the test. So I'm just going to pause for a second and when I pause I want to remind you to make sure you help me spread the word. How do you spread the word? Well, you spread the word by following me and by liking my videos and by sharing my videos. All these things are important to me. So make sure you do that. You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel. There's the long link. And you can email me. Ask Mr. Chu at gmail.com is an email address that comes straight to me. Now we'll continue with problems 10 to 19, and we've been working a little over 16 minutes now in this video. All right, pause this if you need to. Make sure you can work these on a piece of paper, and then know there is shorter videos in my playlist. So number 10, important algebra topic here. This is a system of equations. You're given two equations. There are several ways that you can solve a system. You can graph them. You can use a quadratic formula. You can use substitution, elimination, matrices, uh, lots of different things you can do. So usually if I have y equals terms of x or x equals terms of y, then you're going to use the substitution property. It just makes it a simpler problem. All you do is you substitute that y equals three, negative 3x three and put it in the second equation for x. So where this x is, I'm just going to put parentheses around the negative 3x to multiply it by the 4. So there we go. We put parentheses. Now we're going to combine like terms using the 4x plus negative 3x. And then I put this uh, step in there. Some people don't need it. They automatically know that is going to be 4 plus negative 3 is 1. And 1 times x is x. So that's uh, x equals 15, which is correct choice C. So hopefully you're able to get that one right on that easy system of equations. If you understand substitution, if you don't, just do it just like we did it here. All right. So on number 11, we have what's called a scatter plot. So a scatter plot means there's a bunch of data that has been plotted on an xy coordinate, and you're looking for a pattern. So which of the following equations is the most appropriate linear model for the data shown in the scatter plot? Well, the first thing that you do whenever you have a situation where you've got a scatter plot, you draw what's called a line of best fit. A line of best fit is a line that you draw that has about the same number of points above as below. So I can take and adjust this line. So that I have about the same number above as below. Once I do that, now you have to understand something about equations and how you draw lines and what they mean. So there's my line of best fit. And then I need to think about my slope intercept form of a line. Remember, that's y equals mx plus b that you learned in your algebra class. So the m is the slope, the b is the y-intercept. So if the b is the y-intercept, that's where it crosses the y-axis. Do you see how that's a little bit above the 10? Well, if that's a little bit above the 10, that would mean b equals a little over 10. And it looks like in this equation, it would be 10.1. Well, since a is negative 10.1, I can rule it out. So I'm just going to x it out. And C is negative 10.1. I X it out. So it looks like in the running is B and D. This is just being a smart test taker. 
So the line of fit has a negative slope. How do I know it has a negative slope? Because it's slanting down from left to right. So that means that my M has to be negative. So do you see how D has M as positive 1.9? and B as negative 1.9, that means that B has to be the answer. So I can rule C out because of the positive slope, and that means that B would be my answer. Hopefully you got this scatter plot correctly, and we'll move on to 12 and 13. So pause this if you need to. This is a graph on 13 of a function. It says the graph of y equals f of x is shown where the function f is defined by f of x equals, it's a cubic, ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d, where a, b, and c, and d are constants. How many values of x does f of x equal zero? So you're saying, how many zeros are there, which is where that crosses the x-axis. So let's take and see if I can move these where I think they cross the x-axis. Well, there's one of them in that general area. Looks like these, these are not going to cooperate with me. There we go. I got it to highlight. There's another one. And there's a third one here. If I can get that circle to highlight, who had it and lost it. Sometimes these PowerPoints don't cooperate like I want them to. I had it and lost it again. There it is right there. So it looks to me like there are three places. I've got the burgundy circles around there at x equals negative 1, x equals 4, and x equals 7. That means the graph crosses three points, so there are three zeros. The answer is C. And hopefully you were able to get a C there for three zeros. So that really was just analyzing a graph, wasn't it? It sure was. All right. So now let's go ahead and look at 13, about some cupcakes and party hats. Vivian, Vivian bought party hats and cupcakes for $71. Each package of party hats costs $3 and each cupcake costs a dollar. If Vivian bought 10 packages of party hats, how many cupcakes did she die? buy? So you're gonna have to um, write an equation after you assign variables. So we're going to say H be the number of party hats, H for hats, C for cupcakes. So you know she spent $71. Right now I'm just analyze, analyzing the situation. And each pack of hats costs three bucks, and each cupcake costs a dollar. So now I just have to put that together. So I'm going to take the cost of the hats plus the cost of the cupcakes will equal the total amount spent. And now I'm just going to substitute the H for the hat. C for the cupcakes, the amount I spent with the amount that each costs. So $3 for your packages of hats, $1 for your cupcakes, so 1C, and that equals 71. But she bought 10 packs of hats. So we're going to substitute that 10 in for the H and solve it. So we got 3 times 10 plus C equals 71. 3 times 10 is 30, plus C is 71. Now I'm going to solve it by using the subtraction property of equality. And this was an open-ended question, and it wanted you to get C equals 41 for your answer. Hopefully you got C equals 41, and we'll move on now to problem 14 and 15. So 14 is open-ended, 15 is uh, multiple choice. Make sure that if you need to pause it and work it, that you do so. Number 14 is a quadratic equation. Z squared plus 10Z minus 24 equals zero. What is one solution of the given equation? You can use a quadratic formula, you can factor, you can uh, complete the square. 
you can graph it. All these ways are ways you can do it. Well, which one's the easiest? Well, an easy way to do it is factoring it if it's factorable. Then if it's not factorable, go ahead and use a quadratic formula. So, if az squared plus bz plus c equals 0, then I can say, in this case, a is 1. See how there's nothing in front of the z squared? The b is 10 because bz, there's a 10 there, and c is negative 24. That's a typo there. And I knew I had that when I'd done the shorter versions, the shorter who problem videos. So find number two numbers, m and n, where m, n equals ac, and m plus n equals c, to reverse FOIL and factor. Well, that's the way we teach that in algebra classes. So I have to come up with two numbers multiplied together that give me negative 24 that are added together to give me 10, and I write them as two binomials. So this is what I'm doing. The A times the C, 1 times negative 24 will be negative 24. And when I take and add up those two numbers I multiply by to get it, it has to be a sum of 10. So this is reversing FOIL. And it's a way you teach factors. So what I got to do is I got to come up with a number to put in here for the M and a number to put in for the n, that when I use FOIL to multiply them, I'm going to get z squared plus 10z minus 24 equals 0. So there's only certain possibilities that I can multiply together to get 24. 24 and 1, I could write all these down. 2 and 24, 6 and 4, 12 and 2. So those are our only possibilities. Well, 12 and 2 will give me 24, but I need negative 24. So since I need a positive 10, it'll be a positive 12 and a negative 2. So now if I would use FOIL first, I get my Z squared. Outer, I get negative 2Z. Inner, I get 12Z. And when I add them up, I get 10Z. And then 12 times negative 2, I get negative 24. So that worked. So my job now is to say when you have two numbers multiplied together to give you zero, which I have right here, and I change the plus negative two to a minus two, which they're equivalent. When I take z plus 12 in parentheses times z minus two in parentheses equals zero, I knew that, know that either the first binomial z plus 12 equals zero or the second binomial, z minus 2 equals 0, so I have two cases. So since I know that either the first one equals 0 or the second one, I can solve them now. So I take and subtract a 12 from both sides of the first one, subtract a, or add a 2 both sides of the second one, and I get z equals negative 12 or z equals 2. And then I can take those two numbers and foil them to see if I really had the right answers up here. And so there you go. This is just checking to make sure I had factored that right. And when I combine these two, I get negative or I get positive 10z, which means I did it correctly. So the solutions, and this was open-ended, are negative 12 and 2. And it says, what's one of the solutions? So you'd only had to list one of them. All right. Okay. So number 15, a little bit harder for some students. It's multiple choice, so Bacteria are growing in a liquid growth medium. There are 300,000 cells per milliliter during an initial observation. The number of cells per milliliter doubles every three hours. How many cells per milliliter will there be in a 15 hours after initial observation? This is called an exponential growth problem that you would learn probably in Algebra 1, Algebra 2, or Pre-Calc. 
So in an exponential growth problem in a case like this, my growth would equal a number A times B to the X, where A is the initial value, which means that's what you first looked at. B is the growth factor, where it doubles. And X is the time, which is 15 over 3 or 5. So I'm just using this equation now. Substitute it in. 300,000 is my A, my initial observation. 2 means it doubles. And then 15 over 3, we know we're going to watch it for 15 hours. We know it doubles every 3. So that's going to be 300 times 2 to the 5th. Now is where a calculator would be very helpful. 2 to the 5th is 32. And when I multiply 32 times 300,000, we get 9,600,000. Choice D. Hopefully you're able to get that one right as well. Now we will move to 16 and 17. Make sure you pause this if you need to. I know there's lots of problems here. These are both multiple choice problems. So you're given uh, an algebraic expression here where you're just adding two unlike terms. So it's a binomial. It says which expression is equivalent to this? Well, you could take each one, and this is a smart test taking skill, and multiply them and see which one's going to give you the same one. Or you can try to manipulate this and move it to look like one of these. And you can do that by factoring a GCF. So you write the primes of each term. So 6x to the 8th y squared would be 2 times 3, which would give me my 6. x to the 8th means x just multiplied 8 times. y squared y times y. And then 12x squared y squared. 12 is 2 times 6, and 6 is 2 times 3. So 2 times 2 times 3 are the prime factors of 12. And then x squared means I've got two x's. y squared, I've got two y's. Now you're going to circle what's the common primes. So I got a 2 and a 2 here, so I circle it. I can't circle the 2 and the 3 here, but I've got a 3 and a 3 here. I can circle it. I've got an x and an x here. It has to be in the top and the bottom for a greatest common factor. x and an x here. I've got a y and a y here. And again, it doesn't have to be exactly under each other as long as it occurs in both of them. So I take and circle the commons. I just did that. Then it says multiply the common circled numbers to find the GCF and factor it. So I've got 2 times 3 times x times x times y times y. So that ends up being 2 times 3 is 6. x times x is x squared. So I got my 6 and I've got my x squared. y times y is y squared. So that can be either, we'll see, what did we rule out here? We ruled out none of them. So all of them have the GCF. But it's what's left. So it's what's left in this parentheses. So you look and see what hasn't been circled. X, 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 which is X to the sixth. And the only thing that's not circled is two. The only one that looks like that is C. Now, if you'd have done it the first way I said, and then multiplied all of them out, you would have seen this had no plus sign, we rule it out. No plus sign, we rule it out. So it's going to be one of these two. So you would multiply them out. All right, hopefully you're able to get that one correctly. Number 17. 
A neighborhood consists of a two hectare or hectare park and a 35 hectare residential area. Now, when I first did this video, people were saying, students were asking, what's a hectare or a hectare? Well, it really doesn't matter in this case. It is a unit of measure, look it up. You can always Google it. The total number of trees in the neighborhood is 3,934. The equation 2x plus 35y equals 3934 represents this situation. Which of the following is the best interpretation of x in this context? And then it gives you several multiple choice, and we just have to go through each of them. So we're given that equation. We know that the x is multiplied by 2 for your 2x, which is the total number of trees. y is multiplied by 35, so 35y is the total number of trees in the residential area. 2x was the trees in the park. And so this equation represents a number of trees in the neighborhood. D represents the total trees in the residential area. So it asks, which of the following is the best representation of x in this context? So what does x equal? Well, D was your 35y. And then C was the number of trees, but it's 2x. It wants to know what x is. C said the total number of trees in the park. That's your 2x. And then B is the average number of trees in the residential area, which is your y. But I still haven't gotten to x. A is the correct answer because x represents the average number of trees in the park. So I will circle our A here. Hopefully you're able to get that one right. That is just a matter of interpreting a word problem and then finding what something out of the equation that is written equaled that particular thing in the word problem. All right. Now we'll do 18 and 19. Pause this if you need to. Work the problems out, see how well you do. You can always look at the playlist to find the shorter videos. Number 18 is a graph of a line. It says the graph shows a relationship between the number of shares of stock in company A, that's what's on the x-axis, and the number of shares of stock for company B, which is on the y-axis, that Simone can purchase. So she's got some money to purchase stock. Which equation could represent this situation? So we have to know the difference between A and C and B and D. A and C are both written in what's called slope intercept form. B and D are written in standard form. These are things you study in your algebra class. So here's one of the ways we can figure this out. The y-intercept is going to be b in the slope-intercept form. Remember, here's my slope-intercept form. So b will be the y-intercept. Well, the y-intercept is 40. So is a a y-intercept of 40? Nope. a is not a y-intercept of 40, is it? It is not. That is a y-intercept of 12. So I know I can rule A out because it has a y-intercept of 12. Well, what about C? Does it have a y-intercept of 40? No, I can rule it out. So I'm just being a smart test taker right now. I ruled those two out. So now you're saying, okay, so now these two are written in what's called standard form. The good thing about standard form, you can find the x and y intercepts easily. So the x intercept is 60, and the y intercept is 40. What do I mean the x intercept is 60? Well, that's where it crossed the line, crossed the x axis. So if I set y equal to 0, plug a 0 in here, I can solve for x, and it better be 60 in both equations. So that's what I'm going to do. So to find whether B is going to work, I plug a zero in here for my Y because what is the 
y coordinate here on the x axis, it's zero. Multiply that 12 times zero to get zero. So I have 8x equals 480. Divide both sides by 8, and I get 60. So that looks like B is a correct choice. Let's check and see what happened to D here. So I plug that zero in for my Y, and then I end up getting X equals 40. So I know that D is not right, and I just eliminated everything but the B. That's just using knowledge from your algebra class. Number 19 says a circle A has a radius of 3N and circle B has a radius of 129N, where N is a positive constant. The area of circle B is how many times the area of circle A? So we're going to have to find the areas and compare them using a ratio. Well, remember the area of a circle is pi r squared. So the area of circle B compared to the area of circle A will be the ratio. So the area of circle B, I'm going to look up here, circle B, it has a radius of 129R. So I'm going to put 129 in where the R is. So I got pi times R squared. And now in A, I see that that radius is 3N. So I put it where the R is, pi R squared. And now calculator would be handy. Let's take my 129 squared to get 16,641 N squared. And then I get 9 N squared. And when I reduce that, look what's going to happen. The N's are going to cancel. N squareds are going to cancel because they're in the numerator and denominator. The pi's are going to cancel. And my calculator problem is 16,641 divided by 9, which is 1,849 which is choice D. So hopefully you are able to get that one right as well. Okay, so now we're two thirds of the way done with, the with this first practice module. Two thirds of the way done. So just like we did before, I'm gonna pause for a little bit. Make sure you like this video don't forget to follow me subscribe to my youtube channel you can also forward my videos if you know someone that could use them and now we'll work on the last eight problems number 20 remember you can pause this if needed and then work the problems out start it again we have been working on this now for 43 minutes. It's been a pretty long video. So here's a frequency table in number 20. It's an open-ended question. They both, 20 and 21, are both open-ended, not multiple choice. It says the frequency table summarizes the 57 data values in the number set. What's a maximum data value in the number set? Well, if I would add all the frequencies up, you're going to see you get your 57. And this just tells you that a 6 occurred 3 times a 7, 3 times, etc. It wants to know the maximum data value. Well, we look in the column that says data value. And this will be easy for some if you understand what it means. So what's that biggest number? It happens to be 14. So my answer would be 14 is the largest data member. Yeah, it was an easy one. They're usually not that easy. Number 21. A circle in the XY plane has a diameter of endpoints 24 and 214, an equation of this circle. Now it gives you the standard form of the equation. X minus 2 squared plus Y minus 9 quantity squared equals R squared, and R is the radius. It's a positive constant. Find that value of R. Now there's two ways, three ways, four ways you could do it. You can substitute values in and find it, or I can say I'm smart. 
I know if the diameter is given here, the radius is just half of the diameter. So you could graph this, you could substitute it, or you could use the distance formula. And I just wanted to review the fact that the distance formula will always work. And you're going to have to substitute values in here. And you've got to decide which one is x1, y1, and which one is x2, y2. That's the first thing you have to do. So I've got my two variables. This is either x1, y1, or it's x2, y2. Doesn't matter which way you set it up. So I am going to say, in this case, that here is my x2, y2, just because that's the way I wrote, wrote it in the equation I put down here. You get the same answer if you flip it around. It just looks a little different. So now I just substitute these values. So here is the distance formula. So I do the square root of the quantity x2 minus x1. So I get 2 minus 2, parentheses squared, plus y2 minus y1, 4 minus 14, quantity squared. Well, 2 minus 2 is going to be 0 because you have to do the parentheses first when we're doing our PEMDAS, which came from your pre-algebra class. And minus 10 squared is going to be 100. 0 plus 100 is 100, and the square root of 100 is 10. So if the diameter is 10, you divide that by 2, and you get that the radius equals 5. So the radius equals 5. So I'll just put an equal sign here since it doesn't want to cooperate with me. So we know that equals 5. So those are our two open-ended answers for 20 and 21. Now we will get to our next two problems, which is 23, 22 and 23. So if you need to pause it, pause it and work them and then start it again, and then you'll be able to see how well you did. The measure of angle R is 2 pi over 3 radians. The measure of angle T is 5 pi over 12 radians greater than the measure of angle R. What's the measure of angle T in degrees? You notice they underlined it. But remember, when you're taking an important test like this, if something is very important to them, they will underline or make it all caps or make it uh, in a bold. So in your geometry classes in school, you should have learned the difference between radian measure and degree measure. And you have to remember that one high radian equals 180 degrees. So that's important. So one pi radian will equal 180 degrees. And that's what's called your conversion factor. You notice they don't give that to you anywhere? That's because they want you to have learned it in your geometry class. Okay, so we just have to take and write the expression. We know that the measure of angle T, that's why I write that, the M and then that little angle symbol T, is greater than the measure of angle R. How much greater? 5 pi over 12 greater. So the measure of angle T equals the measure of angle R plus 5 twelfths. I can substitute what I know r is, which is 2 pi over 3. Gave that to me up here. Now we've got a fraction. Anytime you get a fraction, you have to have a common denominator. Well, the way you get the common de denominator, which is 12, I'm going to multiply that 3 by 4, but i got to multiply the numerator by 4. And then when I multiply across here, I'm going to get 2 pi times 4 over 3 times 4 which is 8 pi over 12. 
I'm going to add that to our 5 pi over 12. Now we have common denominators. So I can add the numerator. So it's 13 pi radians over 12. That answer is not up here. It's not up here because we have to use our conversion factor and convert radians to degrees. So remember, if one, radian, one pi radian is 108 degrees, I can put 108 degrees over one pi radian because that equals one. It's like when I multiplied this ratio up here by four over four, which is one, 180 degrees over one pi radian equals one as well. well why did we write it like that? Because we have to cancel our radians out. We don't want radians. We want degrees. And our pi cancels out. So it's going to end up being 13 times 180 divided by 12. I can actually reduce. 12 went into 12 once, and it went into 180 15 times. So it's the same as 15 times 13. You could have done 13 times 180 divided by 12, and again, same answer. And with the calculator, you could have done that had you had one, which is 195 degrees, which is choice C. Hopefully, you were able to convert the radians to degrees. Number 23, that says, a certain town has an area of 4.36 square miles. What's the area in square yards of this town? Then it gives you the conversion. So both of these were conversions. It's just number 22 was open-ended, and you had to know how to convert the pi radians to degrees. And now you're going to be converting the miles to yards. So it's no different. You're going to multiply by one, just like we did over here. So 4.36 miles squared equals how many yards squared? So that's our conversion factor. So I substitute 1760 yards right where the miles, and then I got to square it. So it's a little bit of a different conversion, a big number using a calculator. So 4.36 times 3,097,600 yards squared equals 13,505,536 yards squared, which is choice D. So that's the two different ways for conversions. On this one, you're multiplying to cancel it out. And on this one, you're substituting it in. All right. So now we'll go to 24 and 25. You can pause this to work on them if you need to and then start it up. And we will tell you the answers. So. If you look at 24, it's a multiple choice, so it's 25. You've got a table of values of x and y coordinates. So you could write that as the point 18, 130 in parentheses and do that to all three. For line h, so you're going to have a line h, a table shows x, three x values. So this is line h here. So you could have said that line h would equal those three points and when you connect all the other points that connect those in a graph. So it says line K is a result of translating H down five units in the XY plane. All right, so you have to understand translations. So the first thing I would do would be write the equation of that first line by finding the slope. Now remember, find the slope from a table, I'm going to take the first point, I'm calling it x1, y1. The second point, I'm calling it x2, y2, substituting it in the two-point slope formula so that I can write an equation. So y2 minus y1 is going to be 130, there's my y1, minus 160, there's my y2. Well, it's 130. 
I did that y1 minus y2, didn't I? Sure did. So, we get this right here. Because you can assign it either way. It's just I had flipped them. Here we go. Now we got it. So I'm doing Y2 minus Y1. So I've got 130 minus 160 over X2, which is 18 minus 23. So now it's perfect. So it ends up being negative 30 over negative 5. Had I done it the other way, I'd add 30 over 5, which is still 6. So my slope is 6. So remember the slope-intercept form from the problem we had earlier. Y equals MX plus B. I can put that 6 in where the M is and then substitute any of these points. I just pick the first one, the 18, 130 for my XY. Find what B is. So this is using a lot of algebra. So here's my B, 130 equals my slope 6 times my Y of 18 plus B. So my 6 times my 18 would be 108. Now I solve this using the subtraction property of equality. I subtract a 108 from both sides. So I get 22 equals B. So now I can write that equation. So it ends up being Y equals my slope 6X plus my 22. And now it says, translate it 5 down. So 5 down would mean that that Y intercept goes down 5. So it would be 22 minus 5 which is 17. So my new equation is going to be y equals 6x plus 17. And to find the x-intercept, I'm going to substitute y equals 0, not x equals 0. So that's a typo again, too. So there was two typos in this, and I apologize for that. So I put a 0 here. I'm going to solve this now. Use the subtraction property of equality. Subtract 17 from both sides. Divide by 6. So I have negative 17 over 6 is x. So the x-intercept will be negative 17, 6, 0 because my y has to be 0. Just choice D. So there's choice D. 25, it says in the xy plane, the graph, the graph of the equation y equals negative x squared plus 9x minus 100, which is a quadratic, intersects the line y equals c at exactly one point. What is that value? Well, if it intersects exactly one point, that's the vertex. So the y-coordinate of that vertex would be c, because y equals c. So I know to find the vertex and find the x-coordinate of it, use the formula x equals negative b over 2a, and we know that b is 9, and the a would be negative 1. That's just to find the x-coordinate. So it's going to be negative 9 over 2 times negative 1, negative 9 over negative 2, which is positive 9 halves. So to find the y-coordinate, I'm going to substitute that 9 halves into my original quadratic. So where the x is, I put parentheses and put 9 halves. Where the x is, I put the parentheses and put 9 halves, and I put 9 as 9 over 1, just so we can multiply across. And then I'm going to have to find the LCD after I multiply those out. So that's the opposite of 9 squared is 81, 2 squared is 4. 9 times 9 is 81, 1 times 2 is 2. But if I multiply by 2 over 2, 
That'll have a fourth in the denominator. Find the LCD. And then for my 100, I multiply it by 4 over 4 to get that LCD as well. So now everything has a fourth in the denominator. So now I'm going to take my 81 and add it to my 162. Or my negative 81, sorry. That's a negative 81 plus 162 would be 81 over 4. And then minus my 400 over 4, which is negative 319 over 4, which happens to be choice C. So hopefully you're able to get that one. It's a little bit harder. All right, now we have our last two, and they saved a hard one coming up. And this happens to be, in my opinion, the longest one out of this whole group. We have a system of equations again, and it says for each real number, R, which of the following points lies on the graph of each equation in the XY plane for the given system? So what they did, they took two equations, wrote it as a system, and then they listed point not using the X and Y, but using another variable R. So that made it just a little bit confusing. So let's just go ahead and talk about what happens when a problem is really hard like this on the test. Well, a good test taking strategy is to look at each one of the four answers and rule out the ones that obviously are wrong and find the ones that work. Well, when you do that and you look, A looks like it would be the very hardest one to plug in because it has a rational for my X. Remember, this is going to be your X coordinate, the Y over 5 plus 7. This would be your Y coordinate, the negative. I'm, I'm sorry, the r over 5 plus 7. And then the y coordinate would be negative r over 5 plus 35. So you're going to have to substitute it in one or both. Well, look at the equations. If I take that top equation and multiply everything on the left by 5, everything on the right by 5, I get the same thing, which means it's the same line. So if you plug it into one of them, it's going to also work in the other one. So my last one I would try would be A. So I would try this one last. And then I would try the B, C, and D and see which ones are going to come to I find the one that works. And if it works in one, it works in both. Well, look what happens. Your top equation is much easier. So let's use it and substitute and see what happens, all right? So for D, I substitute uh, X is R and Y is negative 3R over 3 plus 7 over 2. I'm just going to, I'm going to do A last, so I'm just going to go backwards here, all right? So I substitute them in 2 times R plus 3 times, and then I take this expression here, and it equals 7. 2 times R is 2R. I put over 1 times 3 times negative 3R is negative 9R over 2 plus 21 over 2 equals 7. Now I need to get a common denominator, so I'm going to multiply this by 2 over 2. That's just finding the common denominator. So I get my 4R over 2 and my negative 9R over 2, so I can combine those, negative 4R plus negative 9R over 2 plus 21 over 2. So 4R plus negative 9R is a negative 5R over 2. There's two ways to solve this equation right here. Either you can multiply both of them by the LCD, which is 2, 2 over 1, or I could convert the 14 into halves, which would be 14 halves. Both ways work, but in this case, my 2 will cancel my 2, my 2 will cancel my 2, and I just have a whole number here. I end up getting my fraction on my last step whenever I take the equation and solve it. So negative 5R plus 21 equals 14. I use the subtraction property of equality to subtract a 21 from both sides. 
divide by negative 7. Both sides are not equal. So when I substitute this x, which is r, and this y, which is negative 3, r over 2 plus 7 halves. So there was a slight typo up here, but it didn't affect it because I fixed it down here. So when I substitute that in, if it's on that equation, I will have negative 7 fifths on both sides. I don't. This is an open answer. It is not an identity. So both sides aren't equal, which means I can rule that out. That's why I said this is a hard problem. Now we do see. We're just going backwards till we find the one that works. And we're going to do A last just because it's the most difficult one. So I substitute that value for my x and my y. Multiply 2 times r. 3 times 2r is 6r over 3. 3 times 7 thirds is 21 over 3 using the distributive property. Equals 7. 6r over 3 will be 2r. 21 over 3 will be 7. And it would have canceled here to have gotten that same answer if you'd have seen that shortcut. So I have 2r plus 2r plus 7 equals 7. So 4r plus 7 equals 7. Subtract the 7 from both sides. So 4r, there's another typo, equals 0 because I subtracted a 7 from both sides. Since r equals 0 and both sides are not equal, it means it is not on that line. Well, now it's starting to come back to kind of far because it may be A, which is the hardest one. But let's just go ahead and let's try B. We're going backwards. I substitute the two values in. I'm going to multiply 2 times the negative 3R, 2 times the 7, or we can cancel that out. So that's negative 6R over 2, which will be negative 3R, 14 over 2, which will be 7. So I get negative 3R plus 7 plus 3R equals 7. The combining like terms of negative 3R plus 3R is 7 equals 7. Both sides equal. What does that mean? That means that that is on the line. You can go ahead and try A if you want. We've already been in this video for one hour and seven minutes. So B is the answer, and just so that you can see it revealed, you will see that when you substitute A in, you'll see that both sides are not equal. All right. So we've got one more, and then we would have finished with module one, which was our first practice module. And it's kind of a hard one, too. So they left the last two to be hard ones, unless you remember what special triangles are. So you can pause this and try it on your own and then start it back up. And we'll probably be done in another oh, five or six minutes. The perimeter of an equilateral triangle is 624 centimeters. The height of this triangle is k squared of 3 centimeters, where k is a constant. What's the value of k? Pretty complicated. So let's just go through and write down what we know here. You're going to have to draw an equilateral triangle. And remember what's true about an equilateral triangle. All three sides are equal. But it also means that all three base angles are also equal. Because an equilateral triangle is also equal angular. Things you learn in your geometry class. So we know each angle is 60 and we know the perimeter. And we know the height. That's all that we know. So let's go ahead and let's review a little bit about a special triangle. So we know these are 60 degree angles. And I could take now, because I'm going to refer to this in a minute, I could call this angle A just like I have over here on the right. I could call this angle B. I could call this angle C. I could call this angle D here. Okay. All right, now we drew this altitude because it told us the height. And remember, 
the altitude from the vertex opposite a base, drawn in a right angle, will give us the height. So we know that we've got the height of k squared of 3. But on a general special triangle, what's it called? It's called x squared root of 3. And then they tell you that the side opposite the smallest angle, the 30 degree angle, will have a value of x. And it will tell you that the side opposite the right angle will be 2 times that value, or 2x. So now we have to convert that over to our specific example over here. So that means if this h equals k square root of 3 now, let's talk about what we can do here. All right, this is all the things that we listed up here. So I know that this is k over k times the square root of 3. I also know that this little one is going to be, see how it was x and x here? So now this is going to be a k. So I can draw from here to here, and it has a length of k. That also would mean, since geometry teaches you that that cuts it in half, this length here is also k. So add them up. So from here to here is going to be 2k. And that's the length of one side. Well, what did we say in our general triangle here that side AC was? Well, we said it was 2x. Well, in this case, our x is k, and we knew, yes, indeed, this is 2k. And then we know that this one is 2k as well. So when we know that, can't we write an equation now? Yeah, see how when I said you've got to use background information? Oh, yeah. Lots of background information is required here in this particular problem. So we can write the equation now. We know that the perimeter is the three sides added together, which is 2k plus 2k plus 2k. And we know that the perimeter is, it gave it to us, 624, and we know that 2k plus 2k plus 2k is 6k. Divide both sides by k, or by 6, sorry, and you get 104. So I know that that is 104 for k. So if we would take and want to check this open ended problem, and we know this is 104. We know that this is 104 and this is 104, which makes it 208. We know this is 2 times 104, which is 208. 2 times 104, which is 208. And when you take 208 plus 208 plus 208, you get 624. So what do you think? That was all 27 problems worked together in an hour and 13 minutes and 20 seconds. So it took us about an hour and 15 minutes, and I knew it would take some time, but we worked straight through it. So I do have 13 individual videos that are about uh, 7 to 10 minutes with that longest one, maybe 17 minutes to talk about them. Make sure you follow me on X. It's important to me that I can reach out to as many people. Follow me on TikTok. Follow me on Instagram. Follow me on X, but more important even to me than you following me is for you to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Here's the long link. You can also, if you're watching this on a computer, there will be a link over here. And then sometimes for watching on a device, it'd be underneath it to subscribe. It doesn't cost anything, it is free. It does not cost to subscribe. If you have any questions, send them to Ask Mr. Chu at gmail.com. That is my email address that comes straight to me. Spread the word. i got lots of math videos. I've got algebra, geometry, arithmetic, pre-algebra videos, all kinds of them. I've got SAT videos. I've got shortcut videos, and I'm getting ready to start a new type of video, which is going to just be all kinds of math combined that is called 
Math Minutes with Mr. Chu. And I'm getting ready to start those today. So there will be all the other modules, two, three, four, five, six. Eventually, I'm uploading them regularly. I'm starting on module two right away. So just continue to check them out. Once you subscribe, you'll see them come up as my videos. And then keep working hard to work on your SAT. Remember, I'm Mr. Chu, and I want to help you do well in math. So subscribe and watch my videos, and I'll see you next time.